Right. But, yeah. But then I, I got a confirmation email to this event a couple of weeks ago. It looked like one was happening. So, and I was glad to hear that. <laughs> Sanctions or not on Iran following the JCPOA. So, 
give us your sense about what you think the president is going to do and uh, what he should do. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, IBF, for having me, and it's great to be here as part of the Austin Center for New American Security, which is helping co-sponsor this program. Um, so, you know, May 12th is upcoming. I think what we're going to see is the President has said he has issues with the agreement. He has issues on a number of different lines, the missile program, um, inspections regime, and what they're then called the sunset provisions, key restrictions on Iran's nuclear program. Um, that start to expire, I guess, 8 to 13 years from now, and that he would like to see amended in some way um, in, in order to stay in the agreement. I should say, in my view, I agree with General Yatom that the smartest thing to do would be to stay in the agreement right now, um, even if it isn't perfect and it's got its issues, uh, because the alternative of walking away, which I'll explain in a minute, is incredibly unappealing um, and really puts the United States in a weaker negotiating position. Whether you agreed or disagreed with the agreement two years ago, where we are today, if we were to pull out unilaterally, leaves us incredibly isolated, which means it makes it much harder to reapply the type of pressure you need to apply to change Iran's calculus. Um, now, but the President has, that sort of, regardless of that, where we are today, as the President has said, uh, let's try to find these fixes. Um, and what he's been doing, and what his team has been doing at the State Department is negotiating with some of our European partners, the UK, France, and Germany, on what those side agreements might look like. The administration calls it fixing the agreement, the Europeans call it having supplemental arrangements to the agreement because they don't want to move away from the agreement or even claim that they're changing the agreement in any way. Um, I think on missiles and inspections, we've already generally got agreement uh, between the two sides. Uh, on language, it would be acceptable that it would include probably new sanctions on the part of the United States and Europe to try to counter Iran's missile activity. The real question is the sunset provisions. You know, this question of, you know, there are certain elements of the nuclear agreement which stay in place forever, especially on the inspections regime. Uh, but then Iran can start building out its nuclear program uh, by enriching uh, low enriched uranium, uh, by spinning more centrifuges, things that could allow it to have some capacity starting eight years from now. Um, now, are we going to get this? And what the administration would like to do is see the restrictions extended in perpetuity. Now, the way to do that, in my view, the way to try to extend those limitations is with another agreement. I wouldn't really be arguing for another agreement year two or three into a negotiation. Uh, the way nonproliferation agreements work historically, we have a lot of them. They have sunset provisions. If things are working, you negotiate another one. But well, you do it six or eight or after you've had a few years of success. I think it's a little too early to be pushing this, but we are where we are at this point. Um, the question is, can we come to some kind of terms? Um, and I think what the administration would like to see is the Europeans say, we're going to support you. We're going to agree that Iran needs to maintain these limitations. And if they don't, then we're going to start to reimpose sanctions on them. And then after you have that agreement, then you take that to the Russians and the Chinese, you try to build diplomatic consensus, and then you try to press Iran on this. Um, I don't think that's necessarily going to work, but it could if you also include some new incentives for Iran in any future agreement, especially on the side of civil nuclear energy, which keeps the nuclear weapons limitations in place, but could potentially offer uh, the Iranians some economic incentives for staying in. Um, anyway, I, I think most of this discussion is mute because I think that the the most likely outcome is on May 12th, the president does not waive sanctions uh, and starts to walk away as he's been threatening to do for the last uh, two years or a year um, and also on the campaign trail. Uh, and we don't exactly know what will happen when that happens. I think I can sort of confidently say two things that won't happen. Uh, one is Iran's not going to go dashing to a nuclear weapon the day after the United States walks away from the agreement. Uh, I think that they've historically played this slow game where they tried to push, push, push just enough without actually triggering a major international response. Um, this is how they've been developing the nuclear program really since the 80s. And so I think they'll continue to do the same thing. On the other hand, I think some say, well, Iran is going to stay in the agreement and not respond at all because it's going to try to separate Europe from the United States and it has no incentive to uh, get into a confrontation with us. I think that might be true for a very short period of time, but there'll be a tremendous political pressure at home on Iran and lots of elements uh, inside of Iran who oppose the nuclear agreement. Um, and so the notion that the Iranians are just going to sit on their hands and not respond, I think, is also wrong. 
So what you're going to have is this slow motion uh, crisis, not on day one, but over a number of years where they slowly begin to ramp up their nuclear program. I don't think we'll be able to put on the same economic pressure we were able to put on before. We'll be able to put on some economic pressure. I mean, a lot of companies are not going to choose the Iranian market over the American market if, they have, if they're presented with that choice. Um, but you're going to have some of our partners, especially the Chinese, I think, incredibly irritated with us uh, and dare us to reimpose sanctions on them and continue to buy oil from Iran. So you know, I guess the end, what I see as the most likely scenario here is slow motion over the next few years, Iran's nuclear program revs up, we put sanctions back on that are not as effective, uh, and eventually we could be stuck back in the same situation we were in a few years ago when we were facing choices between military action or allowing Iran really to go nuclear. Um, and that's, I think, what we should be trying to avoid uh, by stretching this out as long as possible, negotiating follow-on arrangements, uh, and not walking away from it. Alisa, the, the Gulf states have their own view of Iranian behavior in the region and, and the JCPOA. And if President Trump does indeed decide not to waive sanctions on May 12th and effectively uh, start to blow up the Iran deal, how are the Gulf states going to react? Uh, how do they view the Iran deal today versus how, how they viewed it when it was signed? Um, first, let me thank you, Michael, and the Israel Policy Forum for including me in this discussion today. I think the Gulf states will have probably a number of responses, not all entirely consistent with one another, um, and, and it'll change over time. I think the initial reaction will be to feel vindicated that their opposition to the deal when it was being negotiated is now bearing fruit, that uh, they'll applaud this move as a response to Iran's activity, not only in the nuclear area, but also Iran's activity in the region. Uh, and, and they will see this as, rightly or wrongly, a commitment by the United States to take on Iran both on the nuclear front, but also on, on its destabilizing activities in the region. I think rather quickly, they'll be faced with the same challenge that we faced prior to 2015 and when the negotiations were underway and before the deal was signed, and that is dealing simultaneously with an Iran on a nuclear path, whether slowly as Elon, I think rightly, um, assumes or more quickly, uh, while still dealing with Iran's destabilizing activities all over the region and arguably in a more uh, confident and perhaps even more aggressive form than they were in 2013, 2014 before the, the agreement was signed. So that, that I think the expectation among the Gulf states will be to see the kind of mobilization by the United States that happened in, in the lead up to the deal the massive mobilization of economic pressure, um, the, the willingness to go to partners and th threaten the Chinese, our other partners in Asia, certainly um, try and work constructively with the Europeans on putting pressure on them in order to put pressure on Iran. And, and I think Saudi Arabia, I think the UAE, I think others will expect that the US will dial all of this up. And I think that expectation may not be fulfilled, right? All of this is happening in, with the backdrop of the United States saying things like, we're gonna withdraw from Syria. We're going to um, lower our troop presence because the ISIS, the ISIS campaign is, is, is wrapping up. In fact, ceding more ground to Iran potentially in that, in that arena. Um, you see comments like the, the Gulf states wouldn't exist if it weren't for the United States and, and the support that it gives. So this, in, in simultaneously saying that the Gulf states have to do more, both financially but also more to police their own backyard. So I'm uncertain of what the U.S. administration's next steps might be with respect to how it deals with Iran in the day after of a withdrawal from the deal. And I think the Gulf states will be equally uncertain um, come day two, day three, day 30.
Chuck, a lot of the conversation in the United States surrounding Iran has to do with the JCPOA and nuclear deal. But in Israel, much of the conversation surrounding Iran has to do with Iranians' actions in Syria. And uh, as General Yatom spoke about, it's effort to establish permanent bases in Syria. So talk to us about how the Israeli government views the Iranian threat in Syria and uh, what, what you think they're likely to do about it. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I answer your question, Michael, uh, I would like to do something unprecedented in the history of Israeli national security discourse. In the 70 years of Israel's existence, this has never been dared before, either in Israel itself or in the United States. So everybody sit carefully. I don't want anybody to fall out of their seats and be injured. I'm going to say something positive and optimistic. <laughs> Not about the situation in Syria, that's what I was asked about. And I'll come to that in a second. We just celebrated Israel's 70th anniversary. This is an enormous event, which some of us are taking for granted. Forgive me for, pre for prefacing my answer to your question. But this is the really big event that we should be talking about. The 70th anniversary. General Yatom mentioned the, his honor, his sense of honor having been born in Israel. I was always sorry that I missed the rebirth, no fault of mine, wasn't born yet. But I had the honor of making Aliyah some years later and of making my life in Israel. And at 70, we can say that Israel today is not just a prosperous country and a stable country, but an essentially secure country. And no one can wipe us out anymore. No one can destroy Israel anymore. There are no more existential threats today. And if Iran goes nuclear, we'll handle that too. We'll much prefer that it doesn't happen, but we'll handle that. In any other country, if you tell people well, there are no ex existential threats, people aren't that impressed. In our case, this is a phenomenal achievement. I think Israel's national security strategy has been a tremendous success. And it's something that we can all be very, very grateful for. One of the conclusions that I have reached uh, in the recent book that I published, studying Israeli national security issues for many years, I think that we are strong enough today to be able to take a slightly more, a slightly less offensive military approach. We are strong enough to put slightly greater emphasis today on diplomacy and on defense. We don't have to respond to every terrorist attack. We don't, never have. We can show more restraint and put a little more emphasis on defense and diplomacy. And that is a general recommendation that I think Israel should adopt. And it's from a position of strength. Michael asked me about the Syria situation. And here's a case where, yes, because it's not, in a, it's not a major immediate threat, it's a major medium to long-term threat, we have some flexibility. And we should try some diplomacy. Of course, defense will be a part of it. There's a problem doing that here. We cannot allow Iran to set up a permanent military presence in Syria. I'm the guy who's always advocating restraint, moderation, we're strong enough to take it. Not on this one. We simply cannot allow Iran to do this. This will be a sea change in the, in the strategic picture. Hezbollah in Lebanon, somewhere between 100 and 150,000 rockets, the working figure most people today are saying is 130,000. There is no military in the world that has 130,000 rockets. Iran has built up Iran and Hezbollah are essentially the same thing. Iran has built up an incredible capability to hit Israel very, very hard right from our border. And if I said that we are an essentially secure country today, and I believe firmly that that is the case, the fact is in the next round with Hezbollah, the Israeli home front will be hit as it has never been hit before. I don't think people in Israel and in the United States realize how ugly it's going to be for both sides. And I'd much rather be on the Israeli side of the border than the Lebanese side of the border but it's going to be very ugly. We cannot allow Iran to do in Syria what it started doing 
and what it has already done in Lebanon. Now, part of the problem with diplomacy today is that the United States, I'll overstate the case a little bit, is not playing in Syria. It's not playing. And it's retrenching, retreating from the area in general. And paradoxically, and maybe painfully, the only stabilizing player at the moment is Russia. And I don't know how stabilizing a player the Russians really are. I don't think the Russians want to see a war there. But some conflict between Israel and the Iranians actually may play to their interests. The problem is that this is something which can get out of control at any point, and we cannot allow Iran to continue doing what they're doing. So the real question is if they intend to back off or not. They've seen that the probing attempt, Israel has res responded firmly against this. Are they going to continue or not? If they continue, I believe that Israel has to prevent this at the cost, uh, the potential cost of a war. And that's uh, pretty sad, but that's the situation. And let me still say Israel is, has never been stronger militarily. It has never been more secure. And if we have to handle this one, we'll do so. Nick, the, the Syrian civil war has been going on since 2011. There, at, at times, Bashar al-Assad has looked like he's on the ropes. Uh, at times, he's looked like uh, he's ascending. This seems to be uh, one of those times that, that looks like the latter. So you know, give, us, give us an update on, on what's going on in Syria and, and where you think things are headed. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here today and for my co-panelists. You know, I'd say that almost a decade now into the Syrian civil war, we're an interesting moment. Um, in some respects, uh, Syria right now is less complicated than it was when the U.S. first started the counter-ISIS <coughs> campaign in September 2014. But it's also more complicated, and here's why. While it does seem that Assad and his allies, particularly uh, Russia and Iran and all of Iran's Hezbollah network, are, are in the advance, in fact, it's somewhat of a rush. What we're seeing now is that Syria is, hasn't been a cohesive state for better part of a decade. It is a geographic space. And in that geographic space, you have different foreign actors that are on the ground itself directly to turn the Syrian space into zones. Uh, the zone that most concerns Americans, of course, is the almost one third of Syria that's directly under the US influence, which is mainly in northern and eastern Syria. That's as a result of the counter-ISIS campaign. Uh, we can say that Mr. Trump has very bad, valuable real estate right now in Syria, where it has most of the oil, and he's always been big on taking the oil, uh, it has most of the water resources, as well as some of the best farmland. The question, of course, is how long does the U.S. want to stay in Syria? Can a coalition of the willing, which includes Gulf Arab partners and some European partners, come in to ease the burden on the United States? And to what extent does the U.S. want to have to deal with stability post-ISIS? There's another very large zone in northern western Syria that's directly under Turkish control. And by and large, uh, President Erdogan of Turkey is redrawing the border there. He's extending Turkey's territory southward um, in what we can really call neo ottomanism And that rivalry between Erdogan and Bashar al-Assad, between Ankara and Damascus, is a, a black swan in the future stability of Syria. The next zone, and perhaps uh, the second largest zone, is that zone controlled by uh, Assad and his allies. Uh, that zone spreads from central western Syria uh, all the way to eastern Syria, but it's a tenuous hold. Everything that Assad and his allies hold uh, from central Syria eastbound is very weak. There's an ISIS insurgency, and it could fall back under ISIS uh, within the next several months. The real heart of that zone, which concerns uh, the discussion today, of course, is that part that borders Lebanon, borders the Golan, um, which is where Iran is strengthening itself and where we have a looming crisis ahead of us. As it stands now, there's somewhat of a disagreement between Russia and Iran. Iran wants to turn south and west, wants to expand towards the Golan, where there's a pocket of opposition control that's been supported by Jordan and quietly but increasingly by Israel uh, that sort of stands as somewhat of a shield against the further expansion of the Iranians. Russia, however, wants to look north and west where you have the largest single zone under opposition control, which is guaranteed by Turkey, but where Al-Qaeda and affiliated groups are really set roots. They're really resetting local civil society to create the next horrible safe haven 
uh, that could be used to attack the United States, its Western partners, and regional allies. And it's here because that zone is so close to Russia's major strategic assets that it wants to hold for the next century. Its air base in northwest Syria and its uh, naval facility on the Mediterranean. But the Russians want to take on that zone. And this disagreement between Moscow and Tehran will have major consequences. If Tehran wins that argument and begins an operation in southwest Syria, it can create massive refugee flow, over 150,000 refugees, to add to a pot of over 9 million people that have already been displaced as a result of the war. It could destabilize Jordan's northern border. It could apply pressure on the Golan front, and it can achieve something uh, that is of great uh, security interest to Israel, which is, of course, the fact that Western Syria has become strategic depth for Iran and its Revolutionary Guard Corps to assemble a transnational Hezbollah network of foreign fighters from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, and from Iraq to apply additional pressure in a future war. And I think this is the dynamic that we should all be looking at right now. In the past, it was somewhat simpler. The return address for any type of conflict would, of course, be Beirut. It would be in the Bekaa Valley. It would be in eastern Syria. Now that return address is in the Damascus suburbs. It's in northwest Syria. And uh, fighters from Herat, fighters from Basra and Iraq, fighters from Keta and Pakistan are now sitting. We are now at a moment where you have Basrawis, people from Basra and Iraq, and people from Herat in Afghanistan, primed and ready to be moved on the border of the Golan. And this is what makes the future of Syria, and trying to predict what will happen, very difficult. I'll say this to end, the, to end this remarks, is that right now there's a crossroads in the Trump administration. No one really knows other than the fact that President Trump wants to get out as soon as possible. The US military seems to have won the discussion that to get out quickly and precipitously would lead to the collapse of the stabilized nation ISIS mission. But that's in eastern Syria. That's far away from the heart of the dispute in western Syria, where there's a very real possibility that a conflict between two regional powers, Iran and Israel, could lead to a broad, wider regional conflagration. And there is no real planning for that going on right now in Washington. Nick, just to quickly follow up on, uh, on that for a minute. Um, to, to what extent uh, does Turkey have concerns in Syria beyond the Kurdish zone? And um, to what extent do you think Turkey and Russia are going to, to come to a head over uh, who's gonna control that part of Syria? Well, the Kurdish uh, issue is the sun, moon, and stars of Erdogan because he uses it for his domestic political needs. Um, President Erdogan wants to establish himself essentially as the next uh, Ataturk, and he needs to win his next election. So the Kurdish issue plays into those domestic politics. Look, we have to take Erdogan at his word. He said he was going to go into, he was gonna go into Syria, he did. He said that he was going to collapse a Kurdish zone of control, which was in northern and western Syria. He did. Now he says he's going to cross the major river, the Euphrates, which is the border, into the U.S. zone. And he's going to go all the way through that, essentially destabilizing the U.S. counter-ISIS mission. It's a, big, it's a big concern because he means what he says, but what, what that leads to is a major issue for the United States, major challenge for how do you make sure that ISIS doesn't come back, and potentially a conflict between Ankara and, Mos Ankara and Damascus. And this is where Russia and Russia has tried to find a way to come to an agreement. It's sort of phased deconfliction scheme that would keep the parties separated. And would, uh, ironically, it allows to further fragmentation of Syria. But Assad can't stand that fragmentation. Because of historical reasons, there's a, there's a large area of what was historical Syria that's under Turkish control called Hatay. And this triggers memories. So there's a Pandora's box now that's been opened because the more territory that Ankara has in Syria, the, the more it will argue it needs to stay to keep the PKK. Right. You want to go jump in on Syria for a minute? Yeah, sure. I just I wanted to sort of try to get at some specific things that the US could do to counter Iran and Syria uh, that would actually make, make sense and be helpful to our interests and also to Israel's interests because I'm worried that and despite a lot of talk about the nuclear agreement, you know, our policy on Syria hasn't fundamentally changed from one administration to another. You know, President Obama was criticized for not um, being more forward-leaning on Syria, um, but President Trump hasn't really done anything differently, especially on Western Syria. And so what I would like to see is a few specific things. Um, one 
you know, the fact that we hold this large chunk in eastern Syria, um, we need to stay there. Probably stay there for a long time. At a small level, I think if we've learned one thing about you know, American military intervention in the Middle East, um, 150,000 troops in Iraq is not going to work. Uh, it's too much. The political pressure doesn't allow for it here. It's too costly for our interests. Um, but I think we've also learned that zero is the wrong number. Um, it keeps it has us vulnerable. It doesn't allow us to see what's happening. We got surprised by ISIS. Um, but a couple of thousand troops, training local forces, keeping an eye on the ground, providing them with the types of capabilities that only we can provide, makes a huge difference um, in ensuring ISIS doesn't come back. But also, you know, in making it much more difficult for Iran to move across the battlefield of Iraq and Syria where there's this huge American supported area smack in the middle of it. You know, people talk about this sort of the land bridge from Tehran to, uh, to Beirut or the Mediterranean. You might hear that in the press a lot. But I don't really, I think that that's a misleading term, the notion that there's just like a caravan going across the entire Middle East. Um, but what there is is the ability to move fighters and forces across the re like across this region easily through various road systems and just how much can you move people called lines of communication is what you might call it in military terms. And if the U.S. controls a large chunk of lines of communication in the middle of Syria, it makes it a lot harder for for the Iranians to move easily around. So that's one thing where Israel should be pressing the U.S. and encouraging the administration to stay in. The other is southwest Syria, which Nick started to get to. We're actually quite successful in arming and supporting uh, moderate groups in southwest Syria. The only part of the country where we were successful in doing that is because we did it together with the Jordanians, and the Jordanians controlled that border and ensured that only responsible actors were actually mostly getting those weapons. Um, but in the last year, we've cut off that support, we've cut off salaries for those fighters. And this is a very important, sensitive area uh, because it acts as a buffer. Um, from, you know, against Iran. And so I would really urge the administration to turn, turn that back on. The president turned it off because he viewed that as support for undermining Assad or overthrowing Assad, which, is no, which he says is not long, no longer the US mission. But I think, it's, I think it's a mistake. It's really about defending that border area. And so doing those two things would actually have a meaningful effect in pushing back Iran. The idea that, you know, it's easy to talk about how we can't let Iran get a military presence inside of Syria. How are you going to do that? Is somebody going to invade Syria? I mean, we've let Iran get a military presence inside of Syria over the last few years. Um, and it was, a, it was an American mistake. It was also an Israeli mistake because for years, the Israeli government's position on Assad was, we're not getting involved in that. We're, not, we're, we're worried about Iran, but we're not going to get involved in overthrowing Assad or, like, or, or even making the case for that. But the reality is, if Assad was going to win, what was going to happen? This, obviously. So I think that mistakes on all sides um, you can't overturn it immediately, but at least these are two things that you can do to slowly, over time, try to roll back your Iranian influence. Alisa, let's move to a topic that um, maybe is more optimistic, maybe not, and that is uh, Israel's, Israel's relations with the Gulf states and uh, other, other sunny states in the region. So there is this hope inside of Israel that uh, relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia, for instance, have been improving over the uh, shared threat of Iran, and uh, over uh, perhaps the uh, potential closer economic ties, um, and that this can be done without first resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So, how how do Gulf states view this? And at some point, are they are they going to break and establish relationships with Israel, uh, even if the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is still un unresolved? So maybe marginally more optimistic. Um, so the the shift, and we've we've heard um, already uh, quite a bit about the common cause for the shift, why it's happened. I think, I think there are a couple of other factors that are important to consider because they persist in this context, right? Iran is clearly one. Um, the general mentioned the, the shared uh, experience after 2011 of the Gulf states and Israel being surrounded by an increasing level of instability, which is yet to be resolved. If anything, it has is multiplied in recent years. Um, the, the, the counterterrorism fight, I think, is another persistent uh, shared interest that has only been focused on um, all the more acutely in, in recent years. And I think the other, which uh, we can debate whether or not this is true, but the perception of US disengagement from the region. It was certainly true in, in the latter years of the Obama administration 
I think I would argue that that, that exists today as well and, and is echoed in some of the comments that we've already made. So, so these common, this common cause is, for better or for worse, persistent, right? Um, I think there's another element to it, and you, you alluded to it on the, on the economic front. When you have young leaders, or young-ish leaders, by relative standards in the Arab world, um, like Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, who are looking at how to transform themselves into modern economies, how they are looking to transform themselves into more modern societies. Uh, there's, there's a lot of value in the prospective links that those countries can have with an inv innovative startup state like Israel. So it's not simply on the security front. I think, I think there are those in the Arab world who see a great potential uh, based on their domestic priorities uh, that a relationship, a stronger relationship with Israel could help foster. So that's how you get to things like MBS's statements, um, not only about Israel is not our enemy, but more recently about, about commenting on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, but I don't know that this comes as any surprise. Governments in the Arab world don't necessarily represent the views of their people um, as accurately as we might like. So this progress, I think, hits a natural wall. And you see this manifested just in one illustration, which is the most recent Arab League summit that took place two weeks ago or so. Um, now, I'd be the last person to tell you that the Arab League can do much of anything. Um, but it's, I, I don't think this particular Arab League's communique and the associated commentary around it should be entirely dismissed because it, the king of Saudi Arabia took it as an opportunity to walk back some of the things that his ambitious and, and progressive son said about relations with Israel by focusing the summit as the quote unquote Jerusalem summit. So it, it was an opportunity to kind of restate that Arab states have expectations that are tied up in the Israeli-Palestinian question, um, and an Arab state resistance to some of the moves like the US embassy move in Jerusalem. Um, I wouldn't call them red lines, but I would call them reminders that there are hurdles here that for domestic political reasons, some of these Arab leaders cannot overcome right now. Now, in, in, a, in a version of an Arab state like Saudi Arabia that MBS envisions, a more modern state, a more economically viable state, uh, a more socially perhaps open state, uh, those kinds of domestic moves might free up Arab leaders like MBS to move more aggressively on some kind of detente with Israel. But that's not, that's not the world we're living in right now. Um, and so I think, I think there's good news here and maybe not so good news, right? The good news is that you're seeing this change in tone, you're seeing this change in, in activity, right? Not only um, in terms of security cooperation that has always, how it has always assisted a little bit under the radar, but much more active engagement um, that is not always quiet and not always private, which, which are all good things. These are laying the foundations for that potential break in, in, in establishing some kind of path toward relations that are, look more normal. Um, and those contacts will be really important in that future that MBS envisions and people like MBS envision. I think the not so good news is that the, there's a natural break on that progress. And, and for the domestic politics in the Arab states right now, that, that break is inevitable. Um, should that domestic political sentiment move forward the way Arab government leadership sentiment has moved forward, then I think there's more room. Um, but we're, I think it would be unrealistic to imagine that these governments and their leaders could make that kind of categorical, categorical shift in the current context of their domestic politics. Uh, I want to make sure that we leave time for audience questions, uh, so I'll, I'll ask one last question to, uh, to all of you, uh, open to any of you to answer. Uh, our new Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, is in the region right now. Uh, he's going to Israel, he's going to Saudi Arabia, he's going to Jordan. 
Um, you know, what, what, can we, what can we expect from him uh, in this country? What, what should he be doing? What should he be doing to uh, set the relationship going forward? I'll take one quick crack, which is just to say, one of the most, we were talking about this before, one of the most interesting things about this decision to go first to Saudi, Israel, um, and Jordan, you know, are basically is almost internal US wrangling to signal the State Department's getting back into the Middle East game. This is not Jared Kushner's portfolio anymore. This is Mike Pompeo's portfolio. Because um, for the last year, it really hasn't been the State Department's portfolio. Mike Pompeo has now visited Israel as many times as Secretary Tillerson did. Um, so, you know, I think that that's a signal. And I actually think that's, that's a healthy signal because I think it's sort of, you know, we've had a lot of problems um, with the way Kushner sort of not a lot of communication necessarily going on between what Kushner is saying at the NSC outside of traditional channels and whether it gets to the rest of the government, you end up with a lot of inconsistent messages and confusion. So I think it's healthier to have a, a Secretary of State who clearly has a tr more trust with the President, a better relationship with him, and can come plug into the normal national security decision making uh, process. And also what he said in Saudi, which was, you know, to send the message that you know this continuing to fight with Qatar, which you guys have been doing for a while, is is counterproductive for our interests. So let's try to find a way to end it because we want you guys focused on Iran and we want you guys focused on ISIS. I think those were good messages, and I think that's sort of the signal. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's take some questions from the audience. There's a microphone right up here. Uh, please please line up and. Uh, in the spirit of everyone who has uh, spoken before me, please make sure that your question is indeed a question. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Michael Rothstein. I've got three very short, easy questions. Uh, number one, other than the protection of its naval base on the Mediterranean and its naval base um, in its air base in the north, what are Russia's object objectives in Syria? Number two, uh, recognizing that we have to deal with the Iran that we have, and all policy should be based on that, what is the current state of stability of the regime in Iran? And three, how much is the uh, rapprochement with uh, the, the Gulf states in Israel is dependent on an aggressive Iran? If, for some crazy reason, the regime changes in Iran, does the re relationship with the Gulf states go away? Next, next question, also, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Bauer. I have a two part question. Number one, using hindsight, should our policy goal with Iran over the last nine years been one aimed at regime, regime change? And number two, currently and going forward, should that be a policy goal in our relationship with Iran? Good afternoon, my name is Ellen Cannon. Um, I have two questions. Uh, in contrast to the president who insists that uh, ISIS uh, is a uh, declining power, both ISIS and Al-Qaeda is continuously growing its franchises, both in Africa and in Southeast Asia. What is the role, as Israel is getting very important PR recognition for its entry into relations in Africa, is there a possibility of any foreign policy relationships with Africa that it can increase security between Africa, Israel, and uh, against ISIS and Al-Qaeda in this region? My second question is, another key power player has not been asked, uh, uh, directed uh, in today's talk, and that is India. What role, if any, Will the future excellent relationships between India and Israel play in the growth of national security for Israel in the regions of the world? Thanks. Let's, let's uh, let the panelists answer uh, answer the questions, and we'll take another round. Chuck, you want to? The first question was about uh, Russian objectives in Syria, and yes, of course, they want the naval base and the air base. But it's not just the basis. You have to put it in the perspective of overall Russian uh, policy or strategy. And what Russia wants to do is to become, once again, if not a, a true superpower, at least a major player on the international scene. And they feel that they have been not only downgraded, but uh, humiliated in recent decades. 
And Putin is doing a rather effective job of taking a very, very poor uh, hand and turning it into a rather powerful one. And one of the areas that he can, one of the primary areas in the world in which he can project power is the Middle East, because Russia doesn't really have that much to offer, uh, certainly as a competitor to the United States. What it has is weapons, energy, not an issue in the Middle East, and atomic uh, technology, nuclear technology. Syria is a place where it can sell weapons and it can project power directly and it can counter the United States and maybe Putin's biggest objective is to stick it to the United States wherever he possibly can. Iran, Syria gives him the opportunity to do so. So this is part of global uh, Russian strategic objectives. It goes way beyond the base, the bases which are important enough in their own right. There was a question really whether the growing relationship or the emerging relationship between Israel and the Sunni states is dependent on, the, on Iran. And the answer is largely yes, because it is a shared threat perception that has led to a dramatic change. The very fact that uh, the Saudis and the others are apparently talking to Israel behind the scenes and that there is some concrete cooperation is a dramatic change. And the fact that the crown prince, even if the king walked him back a little bit, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, the keeper of the holy places, Mecca and Medina, says that he not only recognizes Israel as a country, but it's right to exist, this is a dramatic change. We've been waiting for this for 70 years. This is almost, it's not quite, this is almost Sadat coming to Jerusalem. It's, I think it's one of the major turning points in the history of the conflict. But it is, yes, it is because of uh, shared threat perception. They have not become members of the Zionist movement. <laughs> and, and as, uh, as was already at least stated, there is a natural break here, and that is the Palestinian issue, and they can't really come out of the closet, so to speak, until we have at least significant progress, maybe not a deal, but at least significant progress on the Palestinian issue. There was a question about regime change in Iran. Well, we've been working on it ever since 1979, <laughs> since the Islamic regime came into power, and it's any time now. I think anyone who's counting on that is being unrealistic. Iran is a real country. It's a serious country. It's not some tin pot dictatorship that somebody can come and overthrow. It's been a long time since anybody overthrew regimes successfully in the world, uh, at least without in a major invasion, and nobody is talking about doing that in Iran. If there's going to be regime change in Iran, it has to come from the people of Iran. Uh, I think if any of us want to guesstimate when that has happened, that would, w when that will happen, that would be a totally dangerous estimate. Nobody knows. It could happen five minutes from now. It could happen five years from now. It could happen 50 years from now. I think the most that anyone on the outside can do is to provide some quiet support, because it could also be counterproductive, some moral support, but if it happens, it's going to happen because of the Iranian people and should not be an official policy. And I'll just address one more question that was about India, Israel's relations with India. A, an extremely important relationship for, for Israel. Uh, India is today either the number one or number two market for Israeli arms exports. Uh, there's a very strong growing economic relationship. And after two decades of a relationship, we're beginning to see a diplomatic payoff. For example, Prime Minister Modi visited Israel, just Israel. He didn't tie it to a visit to the Palestinian territory. He came and spent, I think it was five days in Israel. He uh, gave it a lot of uh, press coverage in India. And remember, India is a country which was non-aligned. In point of fact, is sort of non-aligned to this day. It was close to the Soviets for decades, and it has been very, very close to the Palestinian position. So this is a, also a very positive change for us. Uh, yeah. yeah, one, one more question over here. Sorry, two, two more questions. Oh, with apologies to the rest of the panel for staying with you, Chuck. You did a great job of scaring the hell out of me and many people in the room. 130,000 Hezbollah rockets, threatening all of our relatives in Israel, and how the next war is going to be so much worse. It seems like you're almost implying the need for a preemptive strike there. Uh, I want to ask you about that. In the past, in the Six-Day War in Entebbe, we had a lot of advantages by knowing where the enemy is, where the resources are. I had no idea the state of intelligence on the location of these 130,000 missiles. 
or the possible success of any such preemptive strike. I want to do the rest of the panel to address that. Uh, three quick challenges, um, and in the spirit of the ground rules where I'm supposed to end with the question, I'll, I'll posit that the um, last sentence in each, each challenge is how would you respond to this? So <laughs> the, the first challenge has to do with uh, Iranian regime ch change. Um, the question is, of course, which was already answered, has, has um, the stability of the Iranian regime been attenuated in any way? Uh, some people suggest that the, the recent protests were sui generis. The scope and diversity was much greater than it ever seen before. And the response, it seemed to me, was, well, it's, it's unprecedented or it hasn't happened in recent vintage that a country crumbled uh, uh, um, as a result of peaceful protests. And I seem to recall that not too many years ago, there was a country fairly sizable called and, and, and the challenge is? I beg your pardon. The, the, the well, question, so, the challenge? So the challenge is, well, why is it not possible that all the experts are wrong? And in fact, the um, stability of the Iranian regime is, is much more frail than the so-called experts are led to believe. Challenge, challenge number two, it has to do with the political dimension of the Iranian treaty. Why is it when people talk about the efficacy of the treaty and what should, what should proceed, that is, uh, excuse me, not the treaty, the nuclear pact. That's, that's the, the clear distinction here, it's not a treaty. Why does no one mention that President Obama, when he was shepherding this agreement, never tried to take his case and use the bully pulpit of the presidency to the American people and explain to them the so-called efficacy of the agreement. Because if he had done so, and as, if he had presented it as a treaty, then we'd be in a very different situation today. And the third challenge has to do with this notion of um, Israel not facing an existential crisis. Now, indubitably, on the face of it, that's very true. Israel's not in a situation it was, thank God, say, during the Yom Kippur War, where its very survival was in peril. But there is such a thing as death by a thousand cuts. And the constant state of war, the constant state of peril, as exemplified, for example, by the tens of thousands of rockets in southern Lebanon, does create a situation where if, if let's say, you're an Israeli academic and you're living near Tel Aviv and you have the opportunity oh. to, to take a okay. spot in thank, the thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, 90 seconds, guys. <laughs> Can I just do really quickly on this, on uh, regime change? Um, Maybe you can predict it, maybe you can't. It's unclear exactly what is going on right now in terms of the protests in Iran. Um, but it doesn't even make, it's not something we can drive, as Chuck said, and it's actually not much of a policy where you can make much of a difference. Look, uh, Obama was very quiet about the protests uh, in Iran in 2009, thought that interfering would be a problem and weaken the protests in 2009. Trump was incredibly loud and embraced the protests in 2000 and. Uh, 17, it's early 18. The results basically thus far are the same. Um, the other thing I'll say is why I think President Obama made a no issue was more politically debated publicly in foreign policy than the Iran nuclear agreement. And the president was out there making lots of speeches and talking about it. Um, when I worked in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we couldn't even get the Disabilities Treaty through the Senate. That's a treaty that was based on a US law, the American Disabilities Act, which then became an international treaty. And then because of the way that the, the Senate and Congress works, we couldn't even get that through. So the idea that we can't, we can, we're going to get the Iran nuclear agreement through a treaty with 67 was just never realistic. And so, anyway, I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I want to address just the last challenge that the gentleman presented mm -hmm. and answer it in a different way. There's a problem. When I speak to American audience, American Jewish audiences, when I speak, to, I teach in Israel, and I say to my students, we don't face any existential threats anymore. We've never been stronger, and our overall national security situation has never been better. I almost have a riot in the classroom. And I encounter responses in the United States, such as yours, which comes, I think, partly from an emotional place. First of all, you're right, there are lots of major threats out there. Please do not misunderstand me to, to say that Israel does not still face major security threats. There is an entire difference, a world of a difference between existential threats and 
even severe security threats. And here the point is, as a people, we have a collective memory. 2,000 years of Jewish history, persecution, insecurity, pogroms, culminating in the Holocaust. Okay. Nothing will ever be able to eliminate that from our national consciousness. And we use the word existential more than not only any other people in the world, but I think global history. We use it in a week more than it's been used in global history. <laughs> we are always about to be marched off into the oven. And that's, uh, that's something that happened to us. Israel today is a strong country. We are the regional power. That doesn't mean we don't face major threats. And chas God forbid, there will be future rounds and we will pay a life, a price in human lives. And every one of those guys is infinitely too many. But nobody can destroy the state of Israel today. And that is something that instead of being you know, upset when the speaker says it, that's something that we should rejoice in because that is a huge achievement. Before I finish the number, I'm going to turn to Mark Slavs, the team of Jewish Science panel. Please give the panel a round of applause for that excellent uh, Thank you, Michael, Nick, Michael, Michael, I'm Mark Slutsky, proud to be a member of the Board of the Israel Policy Forum. Yesterday's Torah reading said two things to introduce our next panel. One, rebuke your neighbor, but do not incur guilt because of his sins. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. We are now coming to this panel that will discuss Israeli-Palestinian relationships. It's a security issue. It's an interpersonal issue. It's an economic issue. It's an issue on every phase of development. So I'd like to introduce the panel to come up that will give us insights into all these perspectives. Holly Bronstein, who's the founding head of Darkenu, a grassroots organization to mobilize and activate the Israeli Center. Khalid El-Gindi, who has served both as an advisor to the Palestinian leadership and to the United States government in both the Commission on International Religious Freedom and the House uh, Foreign International Affairs Committee. Richard Goldberg, who's an advisor for the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and gained experience on the Hill as a Deputy Chief of Staff and Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to former Senator Mark Kirk. And especially we welcome Major General Amnon Rashif, the founder of the Commanders for Israel Security, one of those who emerged as a hero, a proud hero in the Yom Kippur War. So this is a panel that we'll deal with. And of course, Michael Helf, David Helfer, who introduced the program so much information ago. So please, gentlemen, and Holly, come up. Mark, thank you all for spending your Sunday with us. So now let's get to the, the interesting part of the program. Uh, before I start, let's sort of set the table. We have a Trump administration that has talked quite a bit about achieving the ultimate deal. Uh, we've seen a number of recent tumultuous events. We have a Palestinian leadership that is divided between the West Bank and Gaza. We have an Israeli government with a majority of cabinet members publicly actually opposed to the goal of two states. And we have an Israeli-Palestinian issue that's increasingly not making it uh, to the front pages, let alone the newspaper at all, as it gets subsumed by, uh, by regional events. Um, so we have uh, some, some phenomenal guests here to talk about these issues, and, and I'd like to uh, dig into them right away. And I'm going to start with you, Khalid. 
On the Palestinian side, I, I just mentioned that the Palestinians are divided. But I'm curious, what is, is, it's not even really a question I can ask, what do the Palestinians want? Because it's not clear what the Palestinians, if you're talking about the leadership in the West Bank or, or Gaza or the people themselves, and perhaps my question is, uh, in general, how do you address the question of what do the Palestinians hope to achieve today? There's an assumption that they will be opposed to any Trump plan, and yet the Palestinians have also uh, most recently been opposed to any sort of incremental or interim steps as well. Um, so what, what is the strategy? What is the goal? Um, and how do you see things, if I dare throw a, a lump on top of that question, how do you see things shaking out in the coming weeks with the rising tensions on Gaza? <clears throat> um, thank you, David, and thank you all for, <laughs> for being here. And, and uh, no thank you for, um, <laughs> for starting with me, but um, <clears throat> it's, it's an important question and, uh, uh, and, of course, a very relevant one. I think it depends on who you ask. Um, if, uh, if you're talking about the Palestinian leadership, well, we know the official position of the Palestinian leadership. We, they want a two-state solution, a, West, uh, a state, an independent, sovereign state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip with the capital in East Jerusalem. Um, and up until, I think, very recently, uh, this was the uh, pretty much consensus uh, of the political forces uh, active in Palestinian society, but also um, broadly supported by uh, the public. That is changing, uh, I think. If you look at polls now, you have, uh, you used to have a slim majority um, uh, who supported a two-state solution uh, and, um, you know, a, a, a distant second were maybe, say, between 30 and 40 percent of Palestinians who support a one-state solution. And now we see actual parity between those two constituencies on the Palestinian side in the occupied territories. Um, when we're talking about the Palestinian community at large, of course, there is the majority of Palestinians live in the diaspora. Um, and those Palestinians, that Palestinian constituency, which is an important one, I think one that's been uh, neglected by the peace process and by uh, their own leaders for, um, uh, for some time, uh, but that, uh, that constituency has never had a stake in the Oslo process, has, doesn't have a real stake in a two-state solution. Um, uh, and so most of the Palestinian support, the critical mass for support for a two-state solution, was always in uh, the occupied territories. Now we're starting to see a shift in the other direction. And we're, we have, I think, for the first time, a slim majority, not a plurality, uh, it depends, of course, on which poll you look at, but a slim majority that oppose a two-state solution. That's not to say that they have an actual alternative, or at least a coherent one that they've developed. There hasn't, there isn't one that I see on the Palestinian political scene. Uh, there isn't an actor that is promoting a coherent alternative vision. Um, there, there is a sort of a, a trickling up, if you will, of support uh, for one state with equal rights from the river to the sea. But, you know, as I said, there isn't a, a critical mass, there isn't a critical po a political actor that has taken up the banner of one state uh, among Palestinians. And so we have this divided, uh, this division that is not only between the West Bank uh, and Gaza, but also a generational uh, division in Palestinian society, a division between Palestinians inside and Palestinians outside uh, the homeland. Uh, and and uh, there is a, a political crisis or a political state of political stagnation uh, among Palestinians, and and you know one thing that I've sort of been trying to shine a light on is that there's a real need for Palestinians to have an internal conversation about all of these issues, about who leads and how, uh, about what the goal is, uh, whether it's two states or one or something else, um, but. But the old political consensus on these issues um, seems to have collapsed or is in the process of collapsing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that leads to a number of questions, but I think it's a, a useful uh, starting point to ask you, Polly, what's the, what's the discourse like in Israel? If we just heard from Khalid that there's increasing questions about two states and there needs to be an internal conversation, what do you say about the Israeli side? 
I'll give you a, um, a weird answer. You know how at the beginning of uh, this session, uh, the rabbi asked us to stand up uh, and talk about the lives of the young people who died this weekend. And I, first of all, I want to tell you it was very emotional for me because this entire weekend, all of Israel was mourning these uh, ten, uh, children that you, or youth that you read their names. Um, and I'm starting uh, by saying that to you, first of all, thank you for standing up and acknowledging that. Um, so there's a, a different agenda in Israel, and sometimes we forget that things happen in Israel, uh, and we here, or you here, are uh, so concerned about security or about the two-state solution, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and the lives in Israel just you know go on. And in Israel, uh, surprisingly, it's not an issue. You know, every time we call it in Darkeno, we see that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is somewhere between six and seven and eight place of the things that the Israelis are worried about. So things happen very far away in Israel. We look at it from here, and we just don't understand how much Israelis are not concerned with the, with the conflict. So we now have a wall, right, a fence, uh, uh, and uh, we don't see what's happening beyond the fence. Israelis are not aware that there's even Palestinians. Ask you know, youth today in Israel, they can't know the difference between Palestinians living in the West Bank and Palestinians living in Israel that are citizens of Israel. The things that are basic are no longer basic. And so we don't just fight for a two-state solution. We just fight, you know, for awareness. We fight for Israelis to even care. Um, the thing is that we are all also fighting the fear effect that our government is using in order to make Israelis feel like that there's no partner on the other side, there's nothing that we can do about it. If there's nothing that you can do about the conflict, then why even bother thinking about it or doing anything or talking about it if you have no control over the situation because there's, there's no one to talk to on the other side. And with that, if you don't mind, I want to talk about the things that uh, uh, earlier today said uh, the deputy council, I think it's called Itali, who presented here a thesis saying there is no existential threat on Israel. So I want to agree and disagree with what he said. So first of all, I want to agree that there's no existential threat on Israel. I'm just surprised that he said that and that that's, is this the official message page of the Israel government? Because usually when we hear our prime minister, he keeps telling us that there is an existential threat on Israel. I mean, we are so afraid of everything, right? I mean, it's, I mean, right? There's Iran, there's Hezbollah, there's Hamas. We are afraid, and everything that we do and vote for is comes out of that fear. So I'm very really surprised to have an official diplomat of Israel saying, no existential threat. I mean, good news. Um, <laughs> And, well, I'm not a diplomat, and I don't need to be diplomatic, so I can also say uh, why I disagree. Because I think there is one existential threat on Israel, for sure, but it comes from our own very extreme side in the government. So right now, there are um, components of the government in the far right that are pursuing annexation of the West Bank. And it becomes more and more uh, of a consensus. Most of the Israelis, going back to what I said at the beginning, don't understand what that means. You ask them about annexation, they don't know because they don't understand the implications. They don't even understand the word. It's called sipuach in Hebrew. People just don't understand that word. And still, there's an official um, policy of the ruling party Likud to annex the West Bank. And to me, that is existential threat on Israel. And in my movement, Dal Kenu, that's what we fight together with Amnon and our friends from the Commanders for Israel Security every day, the attempt to annex the West Bank. Because what Israelis don't understand because they're not aware and they don't care and they're apathetic or I don't know, is that together with annexing all that land also come millions of Palestinians. It doesn't, it's not empty. <laughs> they're, they're, they're seriously not aware. And so the idea of annexing, putting our fence, our border, around the West Bank, annexing all that land and all the, the Palestinian cities, the Palestinians, 
Uh, I'm not even talking about the fact that it's going to change the character of our state. I'm not even talking about demography. Just you know the, the, the burden on our economy, on our social structure, the, uh, taking responsibility over millions of Palestinians. That, by the way, a lot of them don't want us to take responsibility over, over them. <coughs> Do Israelis even understand the implications of such an idea? And that idea that for many years, I'm, I'm finishing, was, was insane. <laughs> Seriously, it belonged to the very, very far, far right, and, and left, by the way, the far left, um, now comes from our prime minister and from our ruling party. So there is an existential threat. The problem is that most of Israelis are not aware. <coughs> what we do in Israel is fight that and raise awareness and make sure that we push back the idea of annexation right back to the drawer where it belongs. Uh, because if we don't do that, we can find ourselves in a situation where we lose Israel and uh, didn't even notice doing it ourselves, not by our enemies outside, from within. So I know that uh, General Reshev has a lot to add on this point, but at the risk of my life, I'm going to make him go last because I want to ask. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask our American colleague at the table. Given what you've heard, this waning interest on both sides, and even discussing the conflict, how would you assess to this point the Trump administration's efforts? Uh, is there going to be an ultimate deal? Are we going to see the ultimate plan? Um, and what is the U.S. role, what do you see the U.S. role being at a time when many in the region are questioning uh, whether the U.S. can have uh, an active and influential role? Thanks for having me. I would say uh, a couple things. First, uh, there are two basic facts. One is, uh, in my view, there is a God, uh, and I, I am not he, uh, or she, and so I, uh, I, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen and what the crystal ball holds nor do I have access to the secret Middle East plan that, uh, that supposedly exists. Uh, but I think if you step back and, and sort of look at how the Trump administration looked at the Middle East coming into 2017, uh, and I think that you have a president, for better or worse, who likes to challenge assumptions. And that is sort of his MO of how he approaches uh, the Middle East, how he approaches all policy issues. Something that has been said for years, has been accepted as a premise for years, he likes to say, what if that's not true? What if the premise is false? And I think there are a few things that that actually is, is correct uh, when he looks at the Middle East peace process. Uh, for many, many years, we had heard that the central issue in the Middle East, the core issue of the <coughs> Middle East, was the Palestinian-Israeli peace process that that issue was central to all the other problems that existed in Middle East security. Muammar Gaddafi falling was not because of the Israeli-Palestinian issue. The civil war in Syria was not because of the Palestinian-Israeli issue. The uh, Sunni Arab states that now perceive a threat from Iran and, and the Shia crescent that is developing is not because of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And so from a, from a Trump administration perspective, we need to understand that and start looking at the new reality of the Middle East and understand that in the last panel you heard a lot about this and they discussed it, that the Sunni Arab moderate states also don't see the Middle East the same way anymore. That's sort of the number two precondition for how to approach the Middle East peace process for this administration. You have Sunni Arab states that 70 years ago created the Palestinian narrative and problem. They created it as a political weapon to try to win a war that they could not win that year by military means. Over time, when they realized they simply could not defeat the State of Israel militarily, they became hostage to the narrative that they created. And we have reached the point for some of these regimes, including the Saudi new crown prince, MBS, that he's pretty much stated it openly today, they're done being held hostage. That their fate, their future is not dependent on the Palestinian people. And so the Trump administration sees that as an opportunity to embrace this, this new emerging coalition of the Sunni Arab states and Israel as a way to isolate and surround the Palestinian authority and Palestinian leadership and, and try to apply some sort of pressure that hasn't been there in the past from these Arab states. The Palestinian authority is largely dependent not just on USAID, uh, but also on Arab state aid 
and therefore, historically, and, and true today, the Sunni Arab states do have a lot of leverage over the Palestinian Authority. That sort of brings you to the, the, the third piece of this, and that is on um, looking at all of the premises that we've had since Oslo of how to achieve peace. And I think for this administration, they come from a new premise, which is Oslo is dead. There is no more Oslo peace process. If you're going to actually achieve a peace, it's not going to look like what we thought was going to happen in the mid-1990s. That, that framework is gone. We need a new framework, a new way of thinking about this peace process. And so when you look at sort of the final status issues that always prevented a, a peace deal, what broke down at Camp David, what has never been able to come forward from a Palestinian leader and say out loud to his people in Arabic, issues like Jerusalem, issues like the refugee issue, these are things that the Trump administration is slowly taking off the table and simply presenting the realities on the ground. If a Palestinian leader won't say these things to their people, want to keep the hope and myth alive of someday reclaiming all of current Israel, then there are things that we can do to simply lift the veil on these myths, change the realities on the ground. And none of those, none of those statements, none of those realities have to change the idea that there still can be a Palestinian state with, with some sort of parameters to guarantee Israel's security that there can still be a claim of a Palestinian capital uh, in East Jerusalem. Th these things don't have to preclude any of that. But if you wait and wait and wait for a Palestinian leadership that's never going to deliver it, you're going to be waiting much longer than we waited for a Cubs World Series. So uh, there's a ton of questions I have in response to all these, but I think uh, Major General Reshef, if, uh, if we are in this situation where we aren't possible to have negotiations, so then what? Uh, what do you, the commanders, uh, propose? And, uh, and frankly, I also invite you to respond to anything that you've heard here at the table um, as well. David, <clears throat> I'm amazed when you ask what the Palestinian wants. Yeah. And my question, what the government of Israel wants? You know, <clears throat> any kind of small cooperation it has a kind of long-term plan. And I ask myself whether Israel or the leadership of Israel, they have any kind of clue where Israel will be situated in 20, 30, 50 years to come. There is no such a plan. And it's a shame. <clears throat> Having said it, one can blame the, the Palestinians as we do since 1948. The real question is totally different. Where is the Jewish genius? Where is the Israeli initiative? Why are we wrapped to some situation and not leading? Why not to come with a kind of Israel initiative? Now, I think that, and I would like, I would like you to understand what I'm going to say, and including my Palestinian colleague, the way I want it will be expressed. I don't care about the Palestinians. I really care about the future of the state of Israel. So those who think that the only future of one state will be the, the final goal, they are mistaken. I don't see any kind of Israeli leader, and I will fight against it, who will grant full rights to another five million Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza. And you cannot split between the West Bank and Gaza. We can, we can hardly deal with 1.8 Arab, Israeli Arabs, 
they are second rate class in Israel. So what is so I don't think that the Israeli government will annex the West Bank. They are lousy but not as silly. <coughs> no, but, but there is another danger. There is another danger. There is a kind of crippled, crawling annexation, step by step, unplanned. There is no a kind of major plan. There are some settlements are pushing, so they gave some rights. Another one, no. There is a the University of Ariel. And until two years ago, it was a college, and it was upgraded to be university a couple of years ago. Last year, they became to be a, a part of the Ministry of Education Authority who grant academic award to students. So, in a way, <coughs> it's a kind of annexation. In a way. Now they want to implement some Israeli laws in the settlement. So, step by step, unplanned, we might face a situation that we will be intervening, as Professor Chuck said, and we will not be able to separate. So, what is our plan? I don't think that the, the, the situation is right for a, a kind of settlement I'm speaking about an agreement between the two parties, between the Palestinians and Israel. Now we have the ultimate deal. We have been in touch with President Trump's special envoy, Jason Greenblatt. We met him a couple of times and we are in some connection with his team. Uh, we don't know what is Trump so-called peace plan. What I think, and I, I'm aware, there are three different alternatives. One alternative might be that Trump will come with a kind of balanced plan that each party will have to, we will get something, and it will have to pay heavy price. Unfortunately, I don't think that that is the name of the game. I think that President Trump will come with a kind of pro-Israeli plan. Now, here we have two sub -al alternatives or scenarios a kind of reasonable pro-Israel plan and a kind of, let's say, unacceptable or silly plan which will be out of context. Now, I think that the Palestinian leadership will not be able to adapt such a plan, even the moderate pro-Israel plan. <laughs> the only question will be what will be the approach of the Egyptian president Assisi, especially King Abdallah of Jordan. Now I'm going back to the previous panel in very in very short. Although Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia are not democratic countries. Still, President Assisi cannot ignore 100 million Egyptians. He cannot ignore. He cannot ignore the Muslim Brothership. No way. He wants 
to make peace with Israel or to have a kind of world peace with Israel, but he cannot do it because of his people. It's even worse in Jordan. So, how do you call it? Zakmus paper? Yeah? yeah. So, once yeah. President Trump will come with a plan, the real question, no question that Chairman Abu Mazen will reject it, the only question what will be the reaction of Assisi and King Abdullah. Now, just another point. We are speaking about the relationship between Israel and the Arab pragmatic state. I wouldn't call them moderate, pragmatic, because we have a common interest. I am, I'm afraid to tell you that the relationship is one way system. We get nothing out of it. Yes, Air India is flying over Saudi Arabia. Big deal. <laughs> Big deal. They get a lot of intelligence. They get a lot of technology. And something else. We get almost nothing. Now, they cannot go ahead without some steps in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So the only way and is to take the initiative. We came with a very detailed plan and we say no annexation separation. In our plan, and I will not go into it too much, for years to come, <coughs> until a permanent status agreement will be concluded between Israel and the Palestinians, the IDF will stay in the West Bank. In at least 10, 15 years afterward, the IDF will be responsible for security in the West Bank until we will come to the situation that we will be 200% sure that we are secure. So, uh, I have a lot of questions, but I know everyone does as well. So I'm going to invite everyone um, to come and ask a question. It looks like there is no microphone in there. Oh, it's there. Okay, great. So, um, I'm going to take some questions. I may also ask some questions. So we'll take one, but I'm, I re reserve the right to ask follow-up because I have some specific ones I still want to ask. So, but let's jump to the floor because I know people will have questions. Go ahead. Um, yes. Uh, again, thank you, Michael Rusty again. Um, several speakers here today have said that the two-state solution is the only alternative for very practical reasons, the demographic issue being the primary reason. Yeah. And that seems so self-evident to me and probably to most of the people in this room. What I don't understand are those like Naftali Bennett and, and others, maybe some people in this room, who think that a one-state solution, annexation, could ever work. What are their assumptions that allow them to reach that conclusion? I'm mystified, maybe you can help me explain it. So I think that perhaps Polly would be best to answer that, and I'm actually curious then, as I said, I would reserve the right to, to, to nudge. I'm curious if Polly, you might <clears throat> respond to some of what you heard uh, in terms of um, uh, can the Palestinian uh, leadership be pressured, whether it's by Egypt and the Saudis or by the United States, if, if there were such a deal, could they actually sign it even under the best, best of circumstances, um, uh, uh, the pressure of the Palestinians? But Polly, I think uh, if you could answer the gentleman's question best. There are a few annexation plans on the table. Uh, the Naftali Bennett's uh, plan <coughs> talks about annexation only of the sea area. Uh, which is all of the area where all the settlements of uh, Jewish people uh, are. Um, the way Naftali Bennett describes it, we're going to take the sea area and make it Israel, and all of the Arab cities, uh, B and A areas, will stay, uh, he calls it, autonomy on steroids. 
Sears is not, not my expression, his expression. So that means that, the, and for what you just said, um, my colleague here, uh, that shows that the Oslo Agreement is not dead. And I don't like when people are saying that the Oslo Agreement is dead because we're living, we're not just living the reality of the Oslo Agreement right now. The whole idea of A, B, and C and a Palestinian uh, autonomy, this is something that exists today, 22, 21 years after the Oslo Agreement. And the Naftali Bennett uh, proposal of annexation of Area C is based on the Oslo Agreement. Okay, so that's one annexation plan. There's also other annexation plans. I'll take you to the most extreme one by uh, the, the um, National um, um, Union. It's uh, another part of our government, Ori uh, Ariel, Minister uh, M.K. Uh, uh, Smotrich, who uh, they uh, give um, a plan where you annex the entire West Bank, and then the Palestinians on the West Bank have three options. They can either migrate, oh, thank you for that, yes, of course, they can migrate, or uh, they can become second-class citizens, so have all the... Um, um, benefits of a citizen, but not the voting um, right. Or they can feel how powerful uh, the IDF is. I'm, I'm just quoting him. So being in the wrong side of a civil war, I guess. Uh, so this will be the, 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 two, the, the spectrum of the annexation plans. I think what they will tell you the, the right wing, and obviously you can feel that I, I, I don't see how that makes any sense, but they will tell you that uh, annexation is the only way that Israel can, first of all, use the fact that it has the United States now on its side, that it has Europeans involved in their own matters, that it has pragmatic Arab states, again, on its side, and is now able to use that advantage to take over all that land that is Hours. And also, they see no advantage in a Palestinian state. They will use the Arab Spring to tell you that uh, the Arab states around us are unstable. If you let uh, the Palestinians have their own state, it will be taken over by Hamas the same way Gaza was taken over by Hamas. And then we will have the Palestinians sitting on the hills, um, shooting missiles at our airport, and will uh, neutralize uh, Israel. And so um, I think that will be the, the answer to your uh, question. As to demography, we have a fight with the right wing. Uh, they will tell you that there are only 1.8 million Palestinians living in the West Bank, where the IDF official numbers are 2.8. My answer to that is it really doesn't matter if there's 2 million Palestinians or 3 million Palestinians in the West Bank. It still doesn't make any sense for us to annex that. The West Bank. And the last thing I will say to Bennett's plan, which is the most, by the way, sorry, I disagree that they are, we said, uh, maybe not, uh, they're not as silly. I think they're very silly. <laughs> I, think, I, think it's, I think we've seen from this government uh, things that were, um, you know, unrealistic becoming a reality. So I think annexation is a reality. Uh, and I think in that the Bennett uh, plan, what will happen is that Janine and Nablus and Romana and Hebron will become like Gaza. They will become these islands surrounded by a fence, uh, uh, not autonomy on steroids, but ticking bombs, the same way Gaza is. And so that plan is not well thought, and if implemented, will get us into a situation where we have Gaza times five. And since we already have a one Gaza, we know that Israel is silly enough to get us into a situation like that in the future. David. Sorry. Uh, sorry to, to upset you. Too late. <laughs> Bennett, Bennett doesn't have a plan. He doesn't have a plan. He has an, an idea. He has an election campaign. He has an idea, a silly one. Uh, and I, I'll do it very shortly. Right now we are conducting, I, the CIS, look, there is a team of 30, 40 generals and some experts dealing with the very simplification of annexing, whether it's a West Bank, area C, 
my rainbow beam or any part of it. it it's going to be shredded pages uh, study. Now, let, let me just give you some figures to, 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 to get a better understanding why it's not a plan. In the West Bank, area C is 60%. In this West Bank, there are 169 isolated islands. There are tiny villages of one square mile surrounded by Area C. So you're going to kill them. <clears throat> now, most of the land is, which is agricultural land, is in area C. So they have to go to enter into Israel to farm the land. Now the green line is 313 <laughs> kilometers. In a study that we have conducted about regarding the future Israeli border, we are speaking about with the plots and all this stuff, we are going to double it to 700 kilometers after annexing the blocks. With Bennett so-called plan, it will be 1,800 kilometers. Now, suppose that is a village, and, my, and I, Muhammad, who is working here, I have to farm. Do I have to get a visa to enter into Israel? Do I have to get a kind of permission? We are going to have hundreds, if not thousands, of so-called agricultural gates. And who is going to control it? So it's not most, most, of the, most of the area C land it is a Palestinian private land. So, how are we are going to conduct it? Another thing, we think, and we have checked it with some shipbed experts and some other people who are dealing with the Palestinian, once we will annex substantial part of Area C, not even all Area C, the Palestinian Authority will collapse and it will be a real <coughs> chaos. Okay, I, I'm going to ask uh, Khalid to jump in. If there are any other questions, please come up. But I'm going to ask Khalid, um, based on what you've heard, um, to give us some of your thoughts. Uh, generally, I, I have some questions for Richard as well in terms of the U.S. position specifically on the, the threat of annexation. But I'm curious from the Palestinian, if you are. Not that you're speaking for the Palestinians, but if you could provide some perspective on, on, on if the Palestinian were le leadership were hearing this conversation, uh, how do you think that they would be reacting? Uh, I, I will, but before, yeah. well, before I do, I want yeah, to sure. sort of back up to uh, make a broader point, um, which is something that might come as a surprise to people, but I genuinely believe that the Trump administration represents a lot more continuity than, than change. Um, it is uh, maybe a more extreme version, uh, or what I would describe a more extreme version, of the type of US policy that we've seen under Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. And that is real ambivalence uh, about a two-state solution, about the Palestinian leadership, about the 1967 line, about UN resolution, uh, Security Council resolution 242. American policy has been consistently ambivalent, if there is such a thing, on all of these things uh, for the past at least 25, uh, 30 years. And so all of these contradictions that have built up in US policy, uh, the Trump administration has come and says, aha, I'm going to resolve these contradictions, not by restoring the original terms of reference of the peace process, UN Resolution 242, and uh, uh, that settlements are illegal, and international law, and international, universally accepted international standards, no, but by leapfrogging all over, uh, over all of those and simply saying, well, uh, sort of normalizing the status quo. That's, that's what Trump's contribution has been. Is 
he's removed the pretense of the United States insists on 242 or that settlements aren't great. Well, the United States has consistently opposed settlements, but has every administration has allowed settlement expansion uh, explicitly uh, or uh, with a wink and a nod uh, in precisely those areas, the settlement blocks uh, and in East Jerusalem that are the most contentious and that are the most disruptive for a, a two-state solution. So we need to be honest about the American role. Um, and Trump could not have taken this leap of recognizing Jerusalem if Bill Clinton and George Bush hadn't blurred those lines on Jerusalem. Is Jerusalem treated as occupied territory? Yeah, according to people at the State Department, yeah, East Jerusalem is, like the rest of the West Bank, occupied territory. But the reality of US policy is to treat it as something different. It's not quite sovereign Israeli territory, but it's not quite occupied territory. And so that contradiction had to be resolved one way or the other. Um, and, and, and Trump uh, took the leap in the other direction. And the other way that Trump is more uh, continuity than change is in pressuring the Palestinians. Um, whenever push came to shove, whenever it became problematic, whenever things went wrong during the Intifada or when negotiations collapsed, it was the, the, the whether it was Bill Clinton or George W. Bush, the cost was extracted not from the Israeli side, not the stronger party, uh, but from the Palestinian side. Um, and, and that's precisely what Trump has done uh, ad absurdum, if, if that's a, an actual term. Uh, but he has continued this, this trend. Uh, he's wielded these very big sticks. Oh, the Pal Palestinians don't like what I've done on Jerusalem, the fact that I've taken Jerusalem off the table. Well, then I will cut the aid to Palestinian refugees. Um, so there is this huge arsenal of sticks that has been built up. Um, past administrations were much more subtle in how they used the sticks. Um, they would accompany them with occasional carrots uh, for the Palestinians. Trump is not so uh, nuanced in his approach. But consistently, um, there hasn't been pressure uh, on Israel, the stronger party, uh, in this entire process. Not by Bill Clinton, not by George W. Bush. And so if you're not going to pressure the stronger party, um, you're, going to just, uh, you're going to end up uh, uh, deepening that power imbalance. And so what I would say, the answer to the question about why would anyone think that a one-state solution, particularly the one-state reality that exists today, is sustainable, I would say because it has been sustainable, because Israel hasn't paid a price for building settlements uh, for, uh, for the very often excessive use of force uh, against Palestinians that even Israeli human rights groups uh, condemn. There's been no price extracted. So if I'm an Israeli politician and I look at the status quo, status quo is not only sustainable, but it's fantastic uh, because there's no price to maintaining it. There has been no price. Largely, I would say, because the United States has has gone out of its way to deflect uh, a price from Israel to ensure that Israel doesn't pay a diplomatic or military or other uh, cost. Uh, and so the, the current one state reality can be sustained, just simply normalize the status quo. Um, can the Palestinians be pressured? Uh, I think there's been so much pressure uh, on the Palestinians uh, up until this point, that we now see the results of that, of, of 25 years of pressuring only the weaker side. When you apply pressure on a fragile object, it breaks. And I'm not saying that the Palestinian division is solely a product uh, of, of Israeli or American policy, but the peace process has been a major contributor to the weakening of, of Palestinian leadership uh, and, and to the undermining of the legitimacy of the Palestinian leadership. And so someone as accommodating as Mahmoud Abbas, as Abu Mazen, who is bent over backwards, even to the point of, uh, of, of, of maintaining a Palestinian division and, and, and getting into a Palestinian civil war, uh, taking Jerusalem off the table was, I think, the last straw for, for even someone as accommodating as, as, as Abu Mazen. And so there is nothing left. There is nothing left that the United States can offer Palestinian leadership other than more threats and, and sticks, uh, which at this point I think they've almost depleted the arsenal of sticks even. So there's really no incentive for Palestinian leadership, 
even Saudi pressure or Egyptian pressure won't force Palestinians to accept uh, a, a terrible peace plan uh, when, uh, when Abu Mazen couldn't even accept John Kerry's not so terrible uh, peace plan. So, so Richard, I'm going to ask you to respond to a lot of what you heard, but primarily the suggestion, as I think Khaled has laid out, that the U.S. strategy thus far has been to essentially normalize a status quo that he views as quite sustainable. Do you agree that's been the American strategy, and do you think the status quo uh, is sustainable? Yeah, so I, I would disagree with a whole lot of things I've heard in the last several minutes from a lot of panelists, uh, but I'll focus in on, on this question. Uh, I think that the, there's a couple things that you have to look at. Number one, Mahmoud Abbas has probably, in the history of the Palestinian-Israeli peace process, the Arab-Israeli peace process, delivered one of the most horrific uh, anti-Semitic tirades of any Arab or Palestinian leader, even worse than, than his predecessor. Uh, I don't know, maybe he had a nervous breakdown and that's just you know, what he really thought all along. But I don't know how, if you're an Israeli, you ever negotiate again with, with somebody who really sort of shows what they're thinking and what they've been preparing their people for, which is not peace. In the end, you know, we, we, we lived in fear uh, for so long of not doing certain third rail items in the peace process, things that were reserved for the final status in the negotiations under the Oslo process, the process which is dead. And, and, you know, of course, the whole Middle East blew up after Trump announced he was going to move the embassy to Jerusalem, right? We still can't even put out the fires that, that have erupted since then. The <laughs> violence in the streets every single day in all these Arab countries, I mean, how are we going to stop it? And, of course, I'm being sarcastic because it didn't happen. It didn't happen in Egypt. didn't happen in Jordan. didn't happen in Saudi Arabia. It didn't happen. And that is a huge learning lesson, I think, for a lot of Arab capitals who were nervous, especially those like Egypt and Jordan, and, and in Saudi Arabia and others that, that were trying to understand what is sort of the bottom line, what is the minimum that they need in a peace process in order to normalize relations with Israel. So far, all we've seen is one issue that has truly uh, threatened the stability of Jordan, and that was the uh, uh, imposition of security items on the Temple Mount. Uh, we saw protests and riots uh, in Amman that actually the king was afraid of. The issue of where the U.S. Embassy exists and the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel did not have the same impact. Uh, and certainly, I think the Egyptians have internalized that as well. It did not happen in Cairo. The people of Egypt have been through a lot over the last few years. They don't care where the capital of Israel is. And so, if we're going to look as, as the U.S., as what is our role in this peace process going forward, you know, the, the question of, uh, you know, what is the process and and what, what Israeli leader says what about annexation or two states or one state or uh, some sort of autonomy. The, the issue is, is really this. Israel and the Palestinian Authority are not morally equivalent from a U.S. national security and values perspective. They're just not. One is a democracy. One is not. And by the way, the other one that we keep talking about in a two-state solution is two different states. I don't even know why we keep saying two-state solution. There are three states. Gaza and the West Bank are, are, are not coming back together anytime soon. And we can have all discussions about Area A and Area B and Area C and what's this going to look like. Nobody wants to talk about what is going to happen to Gaza. And so far, you know, when you have on one side a free media that can attack its prime minister and investigations that can go on similar to what we see here in the U.S. sometimes, and, and on the other side, no free media. You cannot criticize the Palestinian government, whether you're in Gaza or in the West Bank. When you see an Israeli retired general or Israeli citizens who can openly criticize their government and question their leaders, that doesn't happen in, inside the Palestinian Authority. Somebody of that stature gets shot. You don't do it. And so for us in America, as Americans with basic values, that is how we look at the region and at the, at the peace process. And so when we go forward, there's no reason at this point to ever deny ourselves basic realities that could actually give ourselves a chance for peace. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It's not going to change. Stop the myth and prepare your people for peace. Refugees, they're not coming back. There are no refugees, more or less, at this point. 
you know, there's a report that the, the State Department is sitting on right now that the U.S. Senate passed back in 2012 to ask how many people that are served by the UN Refugee Agency for Palestinians were actually displaced by the 1948 conflict. We think it says maybe something like 30,000, not 5 million, as UNRWA would have us believe. Let's, let's get on with the realities. If, if we're going to wait around for a Palestinian leader to do that, it's not going to happen. And I'll, I'll conclude on this point. We talked about the issues of the divisions between Gaza and the West Bank. Abbas has made himself irrelevant. I think that's largely true. Now maybe, maybe MBS has a, has a way of thinking he can bring him back down from wherever he's at and, and make him a player in the peace process. I'm skeptical of that. Who comes after Abbas? Nobody in this room can tell me. Nobody on this panel can tell me. That is a major question that has to be something that U.S. policymakers and Israeli po policymakers have to be thinking about. And that's why, in some ways, the status quo, so long as the security of Israel is preserved, until there is a better alternative proposed, is going to be what U.S. policy likely supports. Okay. 30. Um, you each get, um, you each um, get literally 30 seconds. I just literally want to say, seconds. you guys applaud, because that was an amazing show of Hasbara. And seriously, you're doing it really, really well. And I, I actually agree with a lot of what you said, and you're good at that. And his English is perfect. He's not like mine. But uh, um, um, it doesn't help. It doesn't help to show how right we are. It doesn't help to, be, to, to, to show that you know they're bad and we're good. It just doesn't help. I'm Israeli. I also think that we're right, right? If I need to choose a side, it's our side. I'm on our side. And I can't say anything about what you said about Abu Mazen. Like, I don't think anything good about him at all. But I want to tell you one thing. If the President of the United States can reach his hand to North Korea, okay, and say, I'm willing to meet with that guy, I think Israel can look at Abu Mazen and say, you know, that's what we have. Whether we want it or not, that's the guy on the other side. And I'd rather have him than Ismail Aniya from Hamas. So I just want to urge all of you, I mean, Hasbara, enough with that. We're on our side, but I mean, let's solve the problem. <laughs> not just me, right? We're not over time, but I promised everyone 30 seconds. So if you, if you don't have, then you can yield, and I'll take your 30 seconds. I'm going to take my 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> I mean, since reality is so important uh, on this panel, then there are other realities uh, that sort of get overlooked. And one reality is there is an Israeli military occupation in the West Bank, and yes, I'm sorry, the Gaza Strip is also effectively controlled by Israel, whether we like to admit it or not. Removing settlers and soldiers does not change the uh, physical reality that Israel controls life in Gaza. So you can't get rid of responsibility and maintain uh, control. So there is a reality of three million Palestinians who are stateless in the West Bank, another two million stateless, citizenshipless Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, 300,000 at least in East Jerusalem. These are all physical realities who have no citizenship and live under Israeli control. That is also a reality that someone needs to take into account. And so there is one state that controls everything, the lives of 13 million people, half of whom are Palestinian Arabs, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. If that is what is called a democracy, then that is a different definition of democracy than the one I have. Simply playing with labels uh, or choosing selective realities does not solve the problem of a stateless People, even if you don't want to recognize them as a people, they are human beings who do not have citizenship, who are controlled, who are subjects of the state of Israel. You can grant them citizenship. You can allow them to have sovereignty in their own state. But there really isn't a middle ground where you can permanently control them in an autonomy uh, and still deny them basic citizenship rights. That third alternative is the status quo, and it is not sustainable. It is the definition of conflict. So I just want to say, uh, did you, um, uh, very, very briefly, and then I'll 30 you. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> when I became to be a young general, I told my staff, listen, I have a PhD degree 
how not to do things. <laughs> Don't tell me why it's difficult and so on. Please come with a solution. Now, when somebody speaks about status quo, it's a kind of illusion. There is no status quo. Things are getting worse and worse. And Israel has to take, whether there is a partner or there isn't a partner, Israel take, has to take its own initiative in order to be secure, democratic, with a solid Jewish majority. And the only way to do it is by separation. Uh, make one final point uh, because just to, to, just so we clarify, I represent uh, myself as an American, not, not as the government of Israel. You should uh, be so, so, so uh, <laughs> while I understand what Hasbara means speaking Hebrew, uh, my views are from an American security perspective, not, not the state of Israel's, though I think those two align almost always. The uh, thing I want to say is peace is only going to happen. However, you want the arrangement, whoever's plan you want to back. To me, that's up to the Israeli government. The peace is only going to happen when a people on both sides are prepared for peace. To me, this is just analytically, the facts are that the Israeli people have been prepared for peace for a long time, and have made peace multiple times with its neighbors. There is no evidence in my mind that the Palestinian people have been prepared for the concessions that would actually end the conflict in their own mind. Whether it's Jerusalem, whether it's refugees, whether it's incitement, whether it's hatred, you need to focus on preparation of the population, and then a lot of other things are possible. I fully agree with you, but what, what is your solution? Uh, you know, just in conclusion, as I turn it over to our, our board member, Alan Silva, I'm going to take off my moderator hat and just put back on my Israel Policy Forum hat, because while there is clear uh, uh, disagreement and debate on this stage, and perhaps even in the audience, I think that's the point uh, of these sorts of programs. Let's have a constructive dialogue rather than speaking to our own bubbles. Uh, and I want to thank you all for spending uh, this afternoon with us to, to engage in these very difficult, challenging, but really crucial and important subjects, uh, and take the opportunity to thank all of my uh, fellow panelists as well. Uh, and thank you all. Alan Solo, off to you. Well, my job is to briefly say thank you to a number of folks, certainly our hosts and all the sponsors, and particularly Rabbi Siegel and our chairman synagogue here, who has now hosted several programs of Israel Policy Forum, and we're delighted to be here. <laughs> Second of all, I want to thank all of our panelists throughout the day uh, who uh, have made me think, maybe given me a headache, uh, but in a good way. Third, I want to thank all of you who participated. I want to give a special shout out to our younger cohort at IPF at Teed. Uh, I'm really engaged in this process, not just in a program like this, but they were in my office a couple of weeks ago to hear uh, a group of speakers. They are really interested in these issues that are going to make a substantial contribution. You know what, Israel Policy Forum, we favor a two-state solution but one that protects Israel's safety and security. What today's panelists demonstrate, as David just said, is this is not an easy problem. And we don't pretend that there are simple solutions. We recognize the complexity. Our job in bringing you to these programs and bringing these speakers to you is to help you identify what the challenges are. And when you leave here, we don't want you to leave being discouraged that we have these challenges. But rather, we want you to take into account what you've heard today and think about how do we move forward. Because the Zionist ideal is that we, the Jewish people, are in control of our own destiny. If we are going to be in control of our own destiny, and if we are going to live up to the expectations that we have of ourselves, both with respect to our own behaviors as Jewish people, the way we treat ourselves and the way we treat our neighbors, it's up to us to take this full range of information that we've heard today, think about what it means, and make decisions 
that allow us to move forward to reach a goal in which Israel will live in peace and security with its neighbors. That's the cause we ask you to join in. We look forward to seeing your future programs. Thank you for your